Today we're here to, um, to dig deep into carbon capture and sequestration. This is uh, the first China Environment Forum meeting of the new year. Not the rabbit year yet, that's in a couple of weeks, so you are pre-rabbit people. Um, um, I, my name is Jennifer Turner and I've been directing the China Environment Forum for 11 years now. And for the past little over a year now, we've been doing lots of meetings on U.S.-China energy and climate relations. Uh, it was uh, in, in great part because uh, the Blue Moon Fund, Rockefeller Brother Fund, USAID, and Vermont Law School gave us money so we could. It's always nice to get that support from, uh, from folks like that. And, but over the past year, I mean, you know, Pete and I, and intern Koshin, we've done a lot on um, the, the China's green revolution, right? It's in the front page of the newspapers, the solar and the wind, and it's all very pretty and nice and flowers. And, but, you know, but every now and then I do, I have to have a meeting on coal, okay? Coal. And I love Jonathan's opening slide, because coal really is the issue. And solving the coal problem, the CO2 emissions, is a biggie. And, um, and I'm really pleased that a lot of you did came, come today, not only that you made it through the snow, but so many of you wanted to come today to, to learn about carbon capture and sequestration. It's kind of a complex, potentially, I don't know, potentially nerdy topic. I'm not sure yet. But, but it is an important one. And, and a lot of organizations, is, um, NRDC has put out a report on it. And that's why we've got David Hawkins here to talk about where NRDC is on this and about the U.S. potential for U.S.-China cooperation on it. But we're going to start off with um, uh, Jonathan Sinton, who is the China Program Manager at uh, International Energy Agencies, Director of Global Energy Dialogue. He, um, he leads the, China, the work cooperation with China, which means he's increasingly busy, right? Leading lots of studies, a recent one on cleaner coal in China, power sector reform, so good stuff that you want to go read online. So he'll be starting us off today in our um, talking about coal, where we are in coal, China's choices with coal, and the trends. And some of you may say, don't, 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 don't go, huh, stuff is changing. And I think it's important to pay attention to this man. Then as I, and then I already mentioned that David Hawkins, um, he, um, he's at NRDC. Um, he's, he was one of the first employees. And I actually, I, 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 I have to say that, I asked him before he came up, I said, so when you joined, did you know it was going to be such an amazing organization? And I think you said you had an inkling. Um, he was in, uh, started NRDC doing uh, clean air work. He hopped on over into the EPA under the Carter administration, hopped back to NRDC. And so usually, David, when people move up the ranks in an organization, they want to choose you know, the corner office and kind of a mellow topic. But you decided to lead the climate programs. No easy thing, you know? Don't want to be bored. Don't want to be bored. Boredom is not an option. And um, so, so I'm, and I'm kind of excited. I've been waiting a while for this NRDC report. And we put, did put the link on our web page and emailed it out to you guys. And last but not least is uh, Hung Wei Liu, who, um, shameless advertising here, he's uh, one of the co-authors of an article on CCS in the China, new China Environment Series issue out there. Please take a copy. Our office is packed with them. We need to... Pete needs room to move at his desk. Um, now, Hung Wei is uh, he's one of those scary people who has too many affiliations, as far as I can tell. Um, he's up at, at Tufts University on their Energy Climate Innovation Program. And that not being enough, he's also an associate in the Energy Technology Innovation Policy Program at Harvard and uh, a guest professor at Development Research Center in Chongqing for the Chongqing Municipal Government, doing some energy stuff in Boston as well. You're a man who clearly doesn't sleep. Um, he's going to be talking to us about, um, talking a little bit about the, the technology roadmap for China. Um, is based on a, a co-authored piece with Kelly Sims Gallagher in Energy Policy. And I told them, I said, hey, we're DC, sophisticated China Environment Foreign Policy audience. You can be, don't dumb it down, but don't scare us too much with the science. So I think we found a nice balance. And we're going to kick it off with uh, Jonathan starting here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, it's good to uh, be back here. Thank you all for, for coming today. I promise to be more concise than I was uh, last time I was here. <laughs> uh, you could say that uh, as goes China, so goes coal, and as goes coal, so goes the climate. Uh, this has been the guiding philosophy of my work for about uh, 20 years. Um, I prob probably not too many other people in my generation grew up with a coal stove in their in their homes. I didn't think much of it at, at the time. Certainly didn't think that my uh, my career would be wrapped up in it. But uh, whether or not you like coal, it affects us all. And uh, even if you don't care about it, you do care about it. 
I'm going to talk about uh, some of the recent developments uh, in coal in China and the long-term scenario results that uh, the IEA has uh, produced that show China's dominant role in coal uh, globally. I'll show that the power sector is crucial and that China's choices are going to shape the path of coal and CO2 worldwide. Uh, last year, about 3.3 uh, billion tons of coal were mined in China. Uh, that's, uh, that's a lot more than uh, projections 10 years would have had it, even five years ago would, it, would have had it. And about 150 million tons was imported, so consumption was somewhere be between 3.4 and 3.5 uh, billion tons. The incremental consumption just since 2008 in, in just two years was uh, a pretty good fraction of total U.S. consumption. Uh, not the entire bit, but uh, enough that we might take notice. Uh, the drivers have been mainly domestic demand, but also international demand for, for Chinese products, of course. Uh, the electricity sector has been uh, the big driver, but also uh, heavy industry. We hear a lot about uh, buildings and other sectors, but this is uh, still much uh, smaller. Um, about uh, uh, if you look at the power sector, uh, coal was really the main uh, event from 2000 to 2009. About uh, over three quarters of incremental generation came from coal-fired uh, power plants. Uh, hydro was less than a quarter uh, as large, and the rest. Uh, although we hear a good deal about them, as Jennifer just mentioned, uh, they don't register on this scale. You can't even uh, see them. Uh, we, that will change uh, over, over the years, but uh, in the recent past has not been the case. Uh, China is now a, uh, a, a major, probably the, well, some consider the primary influence on international coal uh, markets. That's because until 2008, it, was, uh, it had been a next net exporter for quite some time. And then in 2009, it rather suddenly uh, became uh, a big net importer. In part, this was a consequence of falling demand elsewhere and a, and a consequent fall in, in prices. Uh, others were suffering more from the financial crisis than, than China. And that just made the, the relative cost of importing uh, much more attractive compared for, for uh, South and, and uh, south coastal consumers compared to uh, domestically produced coal. Steam coal is the biggest portion of this, but you also see coking coal here. That's likely to persist uh, because uh, China's coking coal resources are, are pretty uh, limited. And Chinese leaders like to point out that their country is more than 90 percent self-sufficient for, for energy. And even with more than half of oil imported now, it's still certainly true, domestic coal provides most of the country's energy. And imports, even though they are very large by the standards of, of the uh, international market, uh, is, as one Swiss uh, trader recently described, described it, uh, merely the snowpack on the Alps of domestic coal production didn't uh, uh, picture it quite quite this way. Maybe it's a little stream running by the foothills of, of, of the Alps. Um, but uh, despite this, the, the the cost of coal is rising. It's certainly come down from its its peaks uh, when energy prices were very very high a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, coal is rising. This this top line, this top pale blue line, is the price of imports uh, into uh, uh, Tsinghuangdao. And uh, that means that imports from elsewhere are becoming and staying uh, attractive. The cost of using coal, of course, is rising uh, as well. Even without climate change concerns, the increasing um, uh, regulation of local environmental pollution has made uh, use of coal, coal-fired power, uh, more, more expensive. Uh, the coal itself is... Uh, uh, coming from different places now, the center of production is and will continue to move west uh, in China. It's going to be coming from deeper seams. The, the uh, quality is going to be somewhat, uh, somewhat lower, and uh, it, 
it's going to be coming from even more water poor regions than, than it is now. Uh, transport lines will have to be uh, stretched even, even further and uh, that is going to continue to increase its, its cost. Of course, when you look at uh, gas, unconventional gas and unconventional oil, uh, other fossil fuel costs are going to be uh, rising as well. Gas is probably the most relevant because uh, we uh, would like to see a, a switch to gas in, in, in power generation. Um, but coal's not getting uh, a, a free ride. Uh, so is coal really uh, the, the, the cheaper alternative? The slide is, is from uh, last uh, summer, a uh, medium look at in the medium term at the relative costs of power generation in a, in a variety of, of countries. And uh, you see these uh, oh, in the, in the uh, left half of the chart here, uh, coal is uh, somewhat cheaper, slightly cheaper than most of the uh, al alternatives uh, and much cheaper than uh, than, than, than renewables, but it's very much dependent on, on coal prices. This is at a coal price of about $85 per ton, and uh, as you saw on the last slide, uh, the coal, uh, coal is uh, up over $120, $140 uh, uh, per ton. So uh, it's not necessarily so that coal will always be the, mo the, the cheapest option in all uh, circumstances. In general, though, it's expected that it will be uh, a, the fuel of choice for some time to come without regulatory changes that will provide incentives for large-scale switch to, to gas, to renewables, or to uh, implementation of, of CCS. So, uh, based on, on current trends in the medium term out to, out to 2015, we see continued growth in coal, uh, about four on the order of 4 billion tons in, uh, in 2015. It's going to be driven by GDP growth, how well China can uh, uh, implement its next round of energy intensity uh, uh, targets and uh, push deployment of nuclear gas and, and renewables. And uh, this, of course, will in turn affect import demand, and it will still be a major uh, force in global uh, coal prices. I'm going to turn to the long term now. Some of you are probably already familiar. Um, uh, I, I know you're already familiar with the, with the uh, uh, latest world energy outlook scenarios. These go out to uh, 2035. The approach adopted in this last version is, is slightly uh, different. The main storyline now is something called the new policy scenarios, and that takes account of policy commitments that have already been announced, uh, even where uh, measures for implementation have not necessarily been identified. So it assumes cautious implementation of the national pledges made in Copenhagen, and um, uh, the current policy scenarios is what used to be called the, the reference scenario, which is the uh, uh, chain the steering wheel, put a rock on the accelerator, point the car at a cliff scenario. Uh, the third scenario is uh, 450, the 450 scenario, which is the, a pathway that's consistent uh, with limiting the uh, uh, average temperature increase to uh, 2%. Uh, in the new policies uh, scenario, energy demand, total energy demand worldwide rises by a bit over a third at 1.2% per year to 2035. By comparison, over the past 27 years, uh, demand grew by 2%. So we're looking at bringing that down uh, considerably, even as uh, developing countries uh, continue to grow quickly. The share of fossil fuels here declines from 81% currently to 74%. Doesn't sound like much, and indeed it's not enough. Uh, oil demand is up 18%, uh, coal demand up 20%, natural gas up 44%. And uh, to, you see e much faster growth in the low-carbon alternatives, nuclear at 10 percent per year and modern renewables at 12 percent uh, per year, so that you start to see them uh, register uh, towards, uh, towards the end of this period. But you really have to look out to uh, the middle of the century before they start to take on a dominant role, or you have to look at another scenario, get to the 450 scenario later. 
Uh, emerging economies are responsible for 93 percent of incremental uh, energy demand. China alone is 36 percent. India is next with 18 percent. Uh, so China and India, you know, we, can, we can't forget about India in, in this mix, are uh, where the, the action is. In the OECD countries continue to shrink in terms of, of share. In 1973, there were 61 percent of uh, global energy. At 2008, 44 percent. By the end of this period, they're uh, one third. Uh, looking at China's uh, primary energy uh, demand, in 2000, uh, China's energy demand was about half that of, of the U.S., but it has since become uh, the, the largest energy consumer in the world. Prospects uh, for growth, continued growth are strong, uh, since uh, per capita energy use is still uh, about 35 percent of the OECD average, and uh, at least for a little while longer, it's still the most populous nation. Um, in uh, these scenarios, we assume uh, GDP growth of 5.7 percent on average to 2035, gradually um, declining uh, over, over the period. And as, as a result, total energy demand grows by 75 percent uh, over that time. Oil demand goes from 9 million barrels per day now to a little over 15 million barrels per day. Gas demand goes from about 100 billion cubic meters to close to 400 billion cubic meters. Coal grows a lot more slowly, but it still rises by about 40 percent. And it is, of course, uh, it remains the backbone of the generation uh, mix. Uh, looking at uh, how coal uh, changes globally, uh, demand Globally, demand for all types of energy is increasing in non-OECD countries. Um, in the OECD, coal and oil uh, decline, and you see the, the decline in, in coal uh, here. Uh, most, of, most of that drop is in the power generation uh, sector, and that, that decline of about uh, uh, 500 million tons of coal equivalent offsets about half of the increase that comes from emerging countries. It doesn't even offset the increase uh, in, in uh, coal, increased coal demand from China's power generation sector. Uh, that offsetting is much less pronounced in, in industry. You see a little bit of a drop in OECD countries and a big uh, push upwards from China, from India, Indonesia, and other major uh, developing countries. Uh, <clears throat> In electricity uh, generation, uh, the use of coal uh, is, is expected to continue to grow, especially up to uh, 2020. Uh, globally, coal remains the leading source of power generation. Uh, even though it share, its share declines, it's about 41 percent today, and it falls to uh, 32 percent in the, in the new policy uh, uh, scenario. Uh, the increase in coal-fired capacity uh, in China alone is about 600 gigawatts, which is equivalent to combined capacity today, uh, coal-fired capacity today in the U.S., the EU, and Japan. Uh, it's the largest single source of incremental uh, CO2 emissions, about 27 percent of global energy-related CO2 emissions to, to 2035. Uh, that piece of information probably is alone is enough for, for you to take away from here. Uh, but uh, on a happier note, the 450 uh, scenario, uh, this, this analysis is based on, on the high end of, of pledges um, uh, from, from the Copenhagen uh, Accord. It also includes some reductions in fossil fuel use from removal of fossil fuel fuel subsidies, and it also assumes uh, strong action after, after 2020. Uh, it assumes that at a very minimum, China meets uh, the high end of its 40 to 45 percent CO2 intensity uh, target. It assumes that it meets its 15 percent uh, share of non-fossil energy uh, goal for 2020 and keeps pushing that uh, there thereafter. Uh, here's a, a look at the 
the shares, uh, the sources of reductions uh, in emissions worldwide. Uh, the top line is the current policy scenario. The, the, uh, that fan is the difference between new policies and uh, the 450 scenario. We need to see reductions in, in all sectors, uh, but uh, the greatest abatement, of course, has to come from, from power generation. We see about half of, of a, a, a abatement coming from, from efficiency, about uh, a fifth each from renewables and uh, CCS. Uh, CCS has to be a key abatement technology in order to reach the 450 uh, scenario. It's absolutely essential. And it uh, comes on uh, both coal-fired and uh, gas-fired uh, power plants, uh, both on new plants and as, as a retrofit. Um, and in the, in the 450 scenario, total generation from fossil fuels without CCS uh, does fall to about half of, it, of its current level. Uh, let's see. Looking, uh, looking at China, uh, its, uh, its emissions peak in the 450 scenario, about 9 billion tons. In, in, in around 2020, and then falls to 5.2 billion tons in 2035, um, well below 1.4 billion tons below uh, current levels. Again, like for the rest of the world, efficiency measures account for, for half CCS and renewables, uh, about uh, a, a fifth. Uh, compared to uh, when you uh, compare these results to the intensity targets, out to 2020, there's not a whole lot of, of difference. Uh, the, in, in 2020, the uh, current policy scenario is equivalent to a 43% reduction in intensity. The new policy scenario, a 46% uh, reduction in intensity. And the 450 scenario is a 48% um, uh, reduction in intensity. That reflects the uh, difficulty of turning around a large vehicle uh, with a big turning radius like, uh, <clears throat> like uh, the largest energy system in the world. Uh, you, but you really see the difference towards the end of the, of the projection period. Um, the uh, reduction in intensity in the 450 scenario is 83% uh, in, uh, uh, compared to 67% uh, in the new policies uh, scenario. Uh, brief look at uh, power generation. Uh, uh, sector here. Um, in the new policy scenario, low carbon uh, generation, that would include re renewables, nuclear, and, and CCS, it's about 38% of total power generation in 2035. The 450 scenario uh, implies a much larger cut uh, with low carbon generation equivalent to 78% uh, of, of power generation. The implication of this scenario is that in China um, and indeed in the, in the rest of uh, the developing world, there's convergence uh, in the performance of, of the power sectors here. And this uh, shows the um, uh, change in, in the structure that you would expect to see uh, in the power sector. Uh, and the, the yellow dots. Are, uh, represent power plant uh, efficiency, and so you see by 2035, your typical power, your average efficiency in non-OECD countries is almost the same as in as in OECD uh, countries. Get this slide. In other words, you have a, an entire generation of uh, power plants passing from the scene. Uh, this is uh, 200. Uh, uh, megawatt plant of the sort that you might see uh, around China, but less and less uh, frequently. Uh, and these are going to be replaced by a, a new generation, uh, are being replaced by a new generation of much larger uh, power plants. Uh, and China's really the only country, well, the, the country where most of the activity is taking place. Those who want to see uh, how new large coal-fired power plants are being built and performing have one destination. Right. Are there tours? Uh, there, uh, there, there are tours. Uh, you might have to, uh, well, I'll go into that. <laughs> there are some complications. Um, the, the, the new policies uh, scenarios uh, results uh, show that 
uh, well, they, they imply that China is going to become a market leader in a bunch of different areas. One is in nuclear plants. One out of every three nuclear plants built worldwide is going to be built in China. One in every five advanced vehicles will be produced in China as well. Uh, the figures are even higher for coal-fired power plants. So why uh, shouldn't China be the leader in coal technologies uh, as, as well? And uh, next speakers are going to be talking about that critical technology of CCS. And I'm sure I look forward as eagerly as you do to, to their remarks. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for um, <laughs> setting the stage. You know, don't panic, right? We're scary stats, but sobering. It's the world we live in. <laughs> oh, no, this is a nice slide. Wall O. Cole. <laughs> and just make sure you speak into the mic since we're on webcast land. And will these do. slides either are or will be on the website. Are they on the website already? Yeah. They are on the website already, so people in Webland can see them, and you all can snatch them later. Okay. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, this, uh, I'm Dave Hawkins, um, and uh, maybe this is an unusual panel, but I'm the second panel member who grew up with coal in uh, his household. Uh, we had a coal-fired furnace in the basement and a coal-fired stove uh, a range in the kitchen, and it didn't mean anything to me except in the winter I had to take the ashes out, um, but... Uh, uh, and I, I didn't, uh, I didn't foresee that I'd be thinking about this issue as an adult, but uh, I have been. Uh, what you see on the screen here is uh, what I call an 80-foot thick seam of archived sunshine. Uh, this is from our um, Powder River Basin, and uh, the point is that there is a lot of coal, uh, and there's a lot of coal that can be got at quite cheaply uh, if one doesn't. Uh, consider all the externalities. Um, the uh, question that NRDC gets asked a lot is, uh, well, why your interest in CCS? Uh, uh, do we need it? And uh, we've come to the conclusion that uh, if we're going to have a robust climate protection program, uh, we do need to have uh, CCS as a part of the portfolio. And I always emphasize that it's a part of the port portfolio. It's not the whole portfolio. But uh, the things that drive us to that conclusion are that the even uh, current emission trends are, are incompatible with protecting the climate, and they're likely to grow. One of the drivers of that growth in emissions uh, is uh, investment in new uh, capital-intensive projects that are long-lived, and a coal-fired power plant is the definition of a high capital, uh, long-lived investment. Uh, because it operates typically for 60 years, possibly more, when you make a decision to build one of these things, you lock in a stream of emissions from that project unless you come up with a technique to keep the carbon dioxide from that project from continuing to go into the air, and that uh, technique uh, at this point is CCS. Um, the, uh, there are lots of studies that document the technical uh, potential of, uh, of clean, air, clean energy investments, efficiency, renewables. Uh, we support all of those studies and we prioritize those resources. But it has to be said that the penetration rate of those resources depends uh, a lot on supportive policy structures. And supportive policy structures depend a lot in many countries on the question of coal. Uh, uh, the reality is, uh, like it or not, and we don't like it, uh, the reality is that um, world leaders in countries that have a lot of coal have difficulty turning their back on that resource. Uh, so a pathway that uh, includes a strategy that allows coal to be used is more likely to gain a political consensus uh, than one that lacks it. Although in the United States, uh, we saw in the last Congress that even with lots of money uh, pushed to uh, coal with carbon capture, that wasn't quite enough to overcome the anxiety of, uh, of a critical number of senators. Uh, so the uh, climate bill uh, died after going through the House. Uh, the final uh, point to mention is that um, CCS is not limited to coal. Uh, CCS can be applied to biomass, uh, and if it is applied to biomass, if we 
grow biomass, and we then use the biomass for energy and capture the CO2 from the plants that use that, uh, the, the power plants that use that biomass, we're actually removing CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, which is considerably better than just not adding to CO2 in the atmosphere. And we, uh, given the, the pace uh, of uh, policy action, uh, it's quite likely that we may we may need to deploy something like this uh, as an emergency break once people wake up and realize how close to the precipice that Jonathan described uh, we are. Um, a couple of uh, statistics that uh, basically amplify what Jonathan has already pointed uh, out to you, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. We focus on the United States and China. Our only office outside the United States is in Beijing, and it's our fastest growing office, like everything in China is. Um, and uh, But the, the reason that we uh, focus on those countries is, uh, as Willie Sutton said, that's where the emissions are. Uh, he didn't quite say that, but if he were alive today, he might. Um, as you see from this slide, and this is from uh, an IEO, uh, IEA uh, a report back in 2007, uh, over 40% of the cumulative emissions from uh, the world uh, uh, will come from the U.S. and, uh, and China. Um, this is a couple of years old, but it is uh, basically uh, not changed uh, uh, maybe by a percentage point or two in the, in the most recent report. Um, again, from a, a 2007 IEA report, uh, something that, uh, that uh, uh, reinforces what Jonathan has presented, those uh, brown bars uh, show uh, the demand for coal in, in 2005 and 2030 in China uh, in the, and in the power generating sector on the left-hand side and on the uh, other sector on the, on the right-hand side. And as you can see, uh, the numbers are huge, um, just uh, without looking at uh, what the y-axis units are, they're huge, uh, and China dominates. Um, uh, and so that is a, f a fact of life that uh, either will have to be uh, acknowledged or changed if we're going to make uh, progress. Uh, I mentioned the lock-in from new uh, coal plants. Uh, when you build one of these plants, as I said, uh, you're talking about uh, probably a 60-year operating life, uh, and the world is still building a lot of them. And in, the, in this uh, slide, uh, the what on, on the computer is a red bar, and on the uh, s slide is sort of a maroonish bar in the middle is China. Uh, the dark blue bar at the bottom is the, uh, the entire OECD, and as you can see again, uh, uh, China uh, uh, dominates uh, the construction of new coal. Uh, the left-hand bar relates to the decade of 2005 to 2015, and the right-hand bar uh, is the 15-year uh, period from 2016 to 2030. This is, again, from a, a several-year-old IEA report. If, if uh, when I update these numbers, uh, those totals will be somewhat larger um, uh, in both uh, the, the current uh, decade that we're in as well as the, uh, the next 15-year uh, period. So again, we have to focus on China if we're going to make some progress here. Um, what is the magnitude of um, the emissions associated with new coal build? Well, it's phenomenally large. Um, the uh, left-hand cylinder uh, indicates the total amount of coal, uh, total amount of CO2 from the human use of coal for the last 250 years, essentially all of human history uh, is, is, uh, in terms of uh, amounts of, of, of coal consumed. Um, and the right-hand uh, cylinder shows the amount of CO2 associated with just the next 20 years of uh, power plant construction as forecast in the IEA forecast. So we are, uh, in, we are on the verge of and in the starting phases of making a commitment to put into the atmosphere emissions that are larger than the entire uh, human uh, uh, use of coal uh, uh, in, in recorded history. And that's just for about 20 to 25 years of uh, capital investment in one technology, coal-fired power generation. Uh, and it um, uh, will chew up the budget. Jonathan mentioned the 450 budget. Well, 
the amount of the budget that uh, can be emitted if you're going to have a 450 part per million target, uh, over a third of that would be consumed just by that, those capital projects. So again, if we, if we don't do something to either diminish the total amount of new coal build or capture the carbon, or preferably uh, do both, uh, diminish the total amount by displacing some with efficiency and renewables, but the residual uh, capturing the carbon from those plants, we cannot make a 450 target. Um, this simply illustrates it, uh, the, this lock-in effect in China, again from an IEA report. The gray, uh, the gray bar, the, the sort of white bar at the bottom, is uh, the, the cumulative carbon associated with uh, China's existing power plants. And as you can see, um, it is swamped by the cumulative carbon that would be emitted by just a decade's worth of power plants uh, uh, planned for construction uh, in China between 2005-2015. Uh, we're in the middle of that decade now, and we're definitely on or above that curve in terms of total amount of, of, of capacity. Um, the... Um, uh, again, uh, the final uh, final statistic here, just uh, how dominant uh, the uh, build rate in China is with uh, uh, another 1,300 gigawatts of capacity, about equal to the world coal capacity today, uh, uh, forecast again in that re recent analysis of IEAs uh, to be built between 2006 and 2000. 30, dominating the, the, uh, the amount of, of uh, build in the power sector. We, we read lots of reports, uh, and they are accurate reports, about the rapid increase in wind and other renewables deployment in China, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's a horse that is far behind the fossil horse, and even though the green horse is running faster, uh, the, the brown horse has uh, so much of a lead, uh, and it's also growing uh, in percentage terms. They appear to be smaller, uh, but the base is so much larger that the, the green horse just doesn't catch up. Um, so we then um, uh, tried to do a, a white paper, which was published in, uh, in December. Um, and what we tried to do in this paper was to put together a, a compendium of uh, work that had been done by a number of uh, institutions, and I want to make sure that I uh, acknowledge them, uh, uh, work at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, at our own U.S. Pacific Northwest La National Lab, work by Tsinghua and Pres uh, Princeton Universities, and also by our colleagues at World Resources Institute. The, uh, the web address is there. Don't, don't bother to copy it uh, down. We can get a copy to you. So one of the things, uh, so what does this report indicate? Well, the first is that there are a huge number of very large CO2 point sources in China, over 1,600 of them, with a very large total emissions associated with these point sources. The reason that this is important is that's where CCS has the potential to be applied, at these large point sources. The economies of scale simply don't work at smaller distributed sources. Uh, the map uh, depicts uh, where those uh, sources are. You probably can't read uh, uh, the legend, uh, and it's not important for the purposes of this. Uh, but as uh, not surprisingly, like much of China, uh, most of those sources are located in uh, eastern China. Um, and uh, then the question is, um, what is the makeup of, uh, of, the, of that inventory? Similar to the United States, uh, the inventory is dominated by the power sector. 73% of those uh, nearly 4 billion tons of emissions are associated with uh, the power sector. But uh, cement is a very significant uh, chunk of the remaining emissions. Uh, ignore the uh, uh, typos, please. Uh, it's really not uh, emissions from Iran, but iron. Um, and uh, refineries needs a little editing work as well. Uh, but you get the picture. Um, and uh, the, these industrial sources, again, like everything in China, uh, it, there's a large scale uh, associated with it. There are nearly 400 of these sources that have high concentrations of, uh, of CO2 in their flue gases. Why is that important? Well, 
it's important because it greatly reduces the cost of capture from those uh, uh, from those sources. Um, the cost of capture is a function of the concentration of CO2 in the flue gas stream. And if you think of the needle in the haystack, the cost goes up as the concentration goes down because you have to basically uh, sift more air through your air handling equipment to get a ton uh, uh, to get a ton out. Um, the other uh, reason the costs go down is that many of these industrial sources use processes which require the CO2 to be separated out in order to make the end product. So the work of separation is already paid for by the product that's being produced, uh, and the only incremental costs would be the compression of that CO2 that's needed to bring it to pressure for injection into underground uh, formations. Um, total emissions from these uh, industrial sources of a couple of hundred million tons of CO2, to put that in context, that's about a tenth of the total uh, emissions from the U.S. power sector. Uh, so it's a significant, uh, significant number. Um, the, the next point is to explore, well, how, where are these large po pollution sources in relation to possible uh, places to stick the CO2, uh, the jargon being sinks? Uh, and the, the good news is that um, they, are, uh, they are close, uh, uh, in, 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 by and large, to uh, potentially uh, significant formations. Uh, again, you can't make out the, uh, uh, the details on this chart. Uh, all those yellow blobs are the CO2 sources, and the underlying cross-hatched areas are potential formations, either what are called saline formations, essentially uh, deep uh, salty rock, uh, 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 in, and then there are gas fields and oil basins uh, as well depicted on this. Um, here are a couple of summary statistics. About half of these large point sources are located directly above these uh, for formations, and 80 percent are within 80 kilometers of the sites. Uh, and that's important because it reduces the overall cost of uh, transporting CO2, perhaps bringing it to an, uh, an order of $10 a ton for CO2 just for the transport. The capture costs are, are additional and substantial. Um, we, in the report, we talk about another, uh, a number of potential uh, locations for CO2 storage as well as another, a number of potential projects. Actually, the projects are real. Um, the, uh, they are potential in, in that they could capture their carbon. Some of them have made some commitments. Uh, others uh, have not yet made commitments. But these are the targets of opportunity. Um, I'm not going to inflict my inexpert uh, Chinese uh, pronunciation on you, but uh, uh, the, 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 you see see both oil fields, gas fields, uh, three IGCC projects, and uh, an important project by uh, Shenhua, direct coal liquefaction, which is in operation. And uh, the interesting thing is that the leadership of the largest uh, coal company in China, Shenhua, and the largest power company in China, Huaneng, are personally uh, very interested in uh, getting a foothold on CCS technology for their respective companies. These are these are people who uh, are capable looking over the horizon. Uh, they have the ability, uh, given uh, their resources and the uh, uh, access to government policymakers, to actually uh, play around with this, and they're taking it seriously. And I think uh, we're going to see those two companies actually uh, driving um, uh, CCS technology uh, in China and perhaps in the world. We make some recommendations uh, in the report uh, that um, we need to have a CCS regulatory framework developed in China. Uh, here in the United States, we've been working on a regulatory framework uh, that EPA has uh, published. Uh, we need a similar uh, framework uh, in, in China. We think it would be very desirable to have direct Western involvement in uh, Chinese uh, CCS demos for a number of reasons, uh, and we have reason to believe that the Chinese uh, participants would uh, be interested in that. Of course, the terms are to be negotiated. Um, technology transfer and joint R&D is almost a uh, de rigueur uh, recommendation of any uh, uh, any report uh, on uh, climate technology, and it's in this report as well. 
Um, those things are easier said than politically done in some countries. And in the United States, I, I think we have a challenge in uh, marketing the uh, idea of technology transfer and R&D uh, in an environment where there will be many voices who say, the Chinese are taking our jobs, why should we be sending them anything? Um, that's a challenge that we are going to have to deal with. Uh, we need a monitoring and verification program in China as we uh, are uh, developing one in the United States. Uh, again, I think that's something that is, is widely recognized. And then finally, we, we need some incentives for carbon capture and storage because the first generations of these projects are going to be more expensive than the competition. Um, and if we're going to get the learning curve going, we've got to find a way of building those first projects so that we can learn and reduce costs for the second and third generation. Um, final comment, the, the, um, the carbon game really is, is different than um, our international uh, uh, relationships in the area of trade, uh, uh, national security. Um, we've got a constraint that's imposed by nature. Uh, the uh, carbon budget is something that uh, nature bats last in terms of what the impacts are. We're going to have to live within nature's rules there, uh, and we can't, uh, we can't uh, uh, infinitely expand our respective markets for the uh, carbon uh, assimilation capacity of the atmosphere. Nature has the rules there. Um, so that means that uh, we don't win the game by emitting more carbon than your neighbor. Uh, we've got to get away from this context that uh, the amount of carbon emitted by a country is somehow an indicator of its uh, economic well-being. It, it isn't. Um, and because of the fact that our two countries dominate uh, the global inventory and will continue to do so for some time, we really do have a strategic interest. Uh, we are competing for a finite uh, capacity in the atmosphere, and the quicker we cooperate to bring down the burn rate, if you will, uh, the more degrees of freedom that we provide to, our, to each of our uh, economies, and that's why uh, we have... Uh, uh, the, the, the final observation that uh, if we do succeed in these uh, uh, efforts, we will uh, help uh, not only ourselves, but, but all countries. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And um, last slide, a little bit of, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to, can I add one thing? There's that, that, um, that, that the question about the tech transfer and the R&D that in the, the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center, that was, you know, it's been, in the making, starting with the Obama who agreements, November two thousand nine, even before that, actually, um, there, evident, next week, you know, Hu Jintao is coming to town, and all of those, those the, the energy consortiums under CERC are going to be looming, you know, meeting and talking. And one of the areas of cooperation is indeed CCS and joint R and D. So it's just like as a segue. And Hungwei, before you start, mm -hmm. did you grow up in a house with a coal stove? Oh. Did okay. you in your house when you grew up? Did house. you have coal? Yeah. Yeah, so here it's like, all right, we got three people. <laughs> he said it was UN fun, fate and destiny. We got everyone. All right, so Hungwei, now you're going to take us on a, you know, a nice parallel path talking about the, um, the technical side. And make sure you speak close into the microphone so we can, uh, okay. yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, my pleasure to have this opportunity to talk about our research on CSS. Um, more specifically, I will address uh, three issues. Um, I'd like to start uh, with the first uh, major CCL opportunity in China. Um, this uh, slide shows the uh, CO2 emission by sector in China. We can see uh, power generation account for about half of China's total CO2 emission, and uh, uh, steel sector, cement sector, and uh, ammonia and uh, methanol production uh, are top uh, Top three CO2 emitter in industrial sector. Uh, uh, therefore, power generation, steel making, cement making, and ammonia and methanol production are major CCS opportunities in China. Um, now, China um, has become the uh, global hub for manufacturing. China is the world's largest steel producer, cement producer, and um, ammonia producer. Uh, some of this uh, has been a migration of labor, capital, energy, 
and carbon intensive industry from other parts of the world, not only to meet Chinese demand, but also for export to other markets. That, that uh, this uh, sector will remain, uh, will continue to dominate China's CO2 emission in the future. Um, CCF uh, is always connected with uh, industrial processes. Therefore, CCF only makes sense for highly efficient uh, in, uh, processes. Uh, the, this Im, uh, implies that CCF enabling technologies are also critical for CCF development. Therefore, uh, a twin prong uh, strategy for CCF and its enabling technologies um, should be developed to promote the, the CCF deployment. Um, this slide uh, summarizes the critical CCS enabling technology in major CCS uh, emission uh, sector. <coughs> uh, the following I will address the detail. Uh, the first is power sector. Uh, in power sector, higher efficiency uh, is critical in tackling climate change. Not only do high efficient uh, coal power plants emit less CO2, but also uh, uh, they are also uh, better suited to add CCS. Uh, usually in power sector, there are two approaches to increase the uh, power, uh, efficiency of power generation. One is through uh, advanced combustion to develop supercritical and other supercritical technologies. Um, another is uh, through system integration. Uh, a typical example is AGCC. Uh, Supercritical and other supercritical technologies will remain dominant technology for new coal power plants in China. And these new coal power plants uh, will remain, are likely to remain in use until 2050 because of, because of the general advantages of low cost, uh, higher reliability and uh, availability. Uh, currently, IGCC looks uh, promising. But given technology uh, choices being pursued right now in China, it makes sense to uh, develop a twin prong strategy. Uh, in IECC system, coal is gasified to produce syn uh, gas uh, that is uh, brought in a combined cycle to produce uh, electricity. Uh, today, IECC has been hindered by higher uh, capital cost. Uh, now in China, Chinese government is encouraging AGCC co-production as an um, important approach to promote the CCS development. AGCC co-production system is an energy system that carbon AGCC and uh, co-chemical production uh, producing both electricity and uh, uh, chemicals like methanol here. Uh, more importantly, if syngas is gasified, CO2 becomes highly uh, concentrated and the gases are at a uh, higher pressure. This offers an important way to, to uh, strip uh, CO2 at least cost. Um, let's turn to the second sector, steel sector. Um, uh, in steel sector, uh, conventional blast furnace uh, technology uh, uh, a dominant technology for iron making is projected that this technology will remain dominant, uh, dominant for iron making in the future. Uh, the main disadvantage of this technology is iron making needs very expensive uh, cook for reducing agents, which causes uh, CO uh, pollution. Uh, now, uh, considerable effort has been made to develop alternative technology to classic uh, blast furnace technology. Uh, two basic alternatives are direct reduction and the smelting reduction. Um, steel plants today are uh, conglomerates of many sub plants. Uh, each uh, has a combustion system and stacks. CCS on main CO2 emitter, here is the blast furnace, can only bring about 30% of the total CO2 emission in, in the steel plant. So the implication of this is that a breakthrough CCF enabling technology are, are needed to achieve a large scale CO2 reduction in steel sector. Uh, here we have a template to propose three uh, breakthrough concepts as uh, 
uh, see that enabling technology in steel sector. The first is power generation based on oxygen blast furnace. Uh, the key technology of this concept is oxygen blast furnace. Uh, unlike conventional blast furnace, uh, each of gas has a higher heating value, which can be used for uh, here, we can, see, can be used for AGCC co-production fuel gas. Obviously, this concept is a more broad multi-product uh, process. Uh, the second concept is uh, polarization based on direct reduction. Typically, um, natural gas is uh, used as a reducer agent for direct reduction. But in China, low-cost low natural gas is very limited. Uh, so exploring economic co-based co method uh, might be attractive proposition. This com by coupling AECC co-production with a uh, direct reduction process, this concept shares one gas fear to produce uh, syn gas. And the third is policy generation based on smelting reduction. Smelting reduction is uh, one of the most promising non-cook iron making technology, but this technology relies heavily on the of gas credit to make the economics uh, economics work. Uh, this, uh, in this concept, the of gas is used as AGCC co-production fuel gas to maximize the of gas uh, credit. The third sector is a uh, um, co se co chemical sector. Uh, um, as in China, ammonia and methanol uh, are produced mainly based on coal. This is in stark contrast with other countries with, where production are mainly based on uh, natural gas and uh, oil. Uh, in this sector, coal gasification technology are critical system and enabling technology. Based on the previous uh, analysis, we have pr uh, proposed a pathway to a low carbon future in China. In the first phase, coal, gas coal is gasified in a standalone uh, plant. Uh, then, uh, uh, through system integration and, and optimization, uh, power chemical and the power steel co-production system can be developed. Um, further, a more broad power chemical and steel co-production system can be developed. CCS uh, can be added to all the uh, uh, processes. And I use this slide to uh, stress another talk, uh, uh, important issue is uh, water. Now China is facing uh, significant challenge on water shortage. So uh, this slide we can see uh, generally ultra supercritical technology uh, consume uh, less water than uh, subcritical. And AECC uh, consumes even less water. Um, when you add CCS, you can see um, there is a significant um, increase in water consumption for use uh, as supercritical and uh, subcritical, but they are only a very uh, modest increase for AGCC. So here we can answer an important question, how to use coal in a common country in the future in, in China. Um, here we have... Um, here is a en energy and water efficient approach to a clean coal. One is uh, through gasification uh, to produce syn gas. You can see syn gas can be used for many different purposes, thereby increase the flexibility of the whole energy system. Also, uh, uh, advanced combustion is essential for a clean cleaner uh, coal strategy. Um, Finally, uh, I want to stress that international cooperation and technology transfer are critical for CCS diffusion in China. Um, this finger shows the geographical location of the parent companies or low carbon technology patent holder. We can see the United States is far ahead on carbon capture technologies and the second strongest in other uh, four low carbon technologies. This confirms the overall leadership of the developed country. Also, the right, uh, on the right side, the table shows the uh, top uh, carbon capture technology patent holder. All the uh, top holders are current oil and gas science, uh, mainly based in developed countries. 
So we propose here is a U.S.-China partnership on CCS, um, because uh, together China and the United States um, account for uh, 60 percent of the world's total coal consumption and contribute contribute over 40 percent of the world's total CO2 emissions. So, and the U.S. has a more advanced science and technology uh, innovation system and have, has well-established regime for bringing technology to markets. And China has a wide range of markets and ha has the ability to commercialize new technologies more quickly and cheaply. Um, okay, uh, I'd like to close by highlighting the three points. The first one is a twin pronged strategy for CCF and its enabling technology should be developed. Second, co gasification and uh, combustion are energy and water efficient ways to, to clean the coal, and this should be giving top priority to enable CCF development in China. Finally, a U.S.-China partnership has a potential to accelerate the CCF def uh, uh, diff diffusion and drive down the cost of CCF in both countries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, also, I mean, a scientist who, I mean, I was, I was, to be honest, I'm always a little scared when I start seeing little flow charts and things. But that was excellent. I actually understood what you were talking about. <laughs> even though I did look at the slides ahead of time. But, okay, so we're going to open up for questions. And, and do, do note, the first, those of you that are new here, there is a lot of CCS intelligence out in the audience, too, and I don't want you all to be shy. So Cushing has a mic, and, and, can you, and because we're webcasting and it will be archived, please make sure you do get a mic. So Cushing, the gentleman right there in the middle, and we'll keep it moving. Succinct questions and comments, and, and, and you can be tough on these guys. Um, hi, I'm uh, Martin Weil from uh, Raven Ridge uh, Resources, which uh, specializes in coal, coal mine methane. Um, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd like to try to to direct a question to both uh, uh, Hungwei and David. And really, you gave very complimentary presentations. I mean, D uh, David's talking about the installed base, which is just and and an installed base of conventional pulverized coal, even ultra-critical, that's growing by at, at tremendous rates for the foreseeable future. And Hung Wei, who's talking about new technologies that provide sort of uh, riper, lower-hanging fruit for, for CCS. But the issue is, as I, I think a very important issue, is how to deal with the, ins with the carbon emissions of the installed and, and about to be newly installed coal base. And I'd really like you guys to comment in as much depth as you can about the potential for CCS from, the, from both existing and uh, newly to be built uh, pulverized coal power plants. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, and uh, I'll start with an observation about the very different markets in the U.S. and China. Uh, in the U.S., we have about 330 gigawatts of coal-fired power plants, uh, and they're pretty rapidly aging. In another decade, more than half of them are going to be 50 years old. Uh, and so if you're going to install something on a 50-year-old power plant, it better be pretty cheap, uh, and uh, both to uh, both uh, capital investment and, and cheap to operate. Uh, in China, the, the picture is completely different, and the, and the picture has become completely different really in the last five years, because in the last five years, China has built the equivalent of the U.S. coal fleet, and they're all uh, toddlers. They'll be around for 60 years. And 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 then you have the in the coming decade or so you're going to have another uh, another huge chunk of capacity all of which is going to have a 60 year roughly life ahead of it, so the 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 market for retrofit technology in China is huge. Um, uh, it's it's big in the United States, uh, but it's huge in in China. Uh, and because of this f fact that we have one atmosphere, there's a strategic interest in the United States to uh, help participate uh, in development of retrofit technologies, uh, both to deal with the fact that we still have a, a, a significant tail of emissions associated with our installed base, but even more importantly, um, that's, th that's the way you're going to get cumulative emissions down from uh, the Chinese installed base. Um, I... I, I'm a lawyer. I'm not an engineer, uh, but I've paid a lot of attention to uh, engineering developments uh, in the 40 years I've been doing environmental work, uh, and I am optimistic that um, 
we're going to find, uh, uh, I don't know that breakthrough is the right word, but we're going to find ways to capture carbon from the installed base that are dramatically less expensive than uh, than the current engineering estimates are today. I mean, we have to understand that uh, carbon capture technology as it's, uh, as it's being designed today, especially for retrofit applications, is essentially ported over from other types of industrial applications. It really, only in the last few years, has there been a significant effort put into kind of looking at a power plant and trying to figure out how to optimize the entire power plant so that when it's operating in a carbon capture mode. And when we have more uh, intelligent uh, engineers with more money to throw at this problem, which is what we would get if we have the right policy environment, um, we're going to find, I think we're going to surprise ourselves positively on, on this score. Uh, there are a couple of projects in the United States. There are a couple of companies that are that are uh, involved in this. Alstom is a, is an example of a company that uh, you know five years ago Alstom had PowerPoint presentations to th talking about uh, retrofit technology, but that's about all they had. Um, now they have a business line and they are uh, serious about it. There are other uh, retrofit technologies that are also serious. Uh, and um, that's the kind of change that we're going to need to see. But we're actually going to have to build a few of these projects. Uh, there's, uh, there's a project in West Virginia near, not too far from Washington, the Mountaineer Project, uh, that uh, has received uh, about a $300-plus million dollar grant from uh, Department of Energy. But that alone is not going to be enough to get it, uh, get it built. Uh, the company, AEP, was counting on the passage of climate legislation that would have put a price on carbon and would have then... Uh, made it rational to actually install this equipment on that uh, power plant. So that's a challenge. There's a financing gap to be met there. Uh, there are other projects in China which are, are real uh, and moving forward. So, uh, and, and so those are the ones they have to actually get built. Uh, it would be a tremendous opportunity for the U.S. and China to collaborate, figure out how to make it work. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the politics here are challenging, but the opportunity is is large, and and the need is 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 great. Okay, Hungwei, do you have any comment to add? Uh, okay, uh, and coal accounts for about ninety four percent of China's total uh, fossil fuel energy reserves, and. Uh, now, coal about uh, account for about uh, seven percent of China's uh, total cons energy consumption, and even in the future, in until twenty fifty, <coughs> now uh, coal will remain account for about uh, uh, over forty percent, maybe. So, so we will know this. I think one question lives with us is how to use coal in a carbon constrained future. The CCS may provide a solution. Uh, and now CTS is is, is uh, expensive, but I think if compare with with the, the case w without CTS, CTS may be a, a relatively cheaper way to save our environment. Okay. Well, good. So um, got some other questions out there. I got um, how about Steve, real quick, and uh, and also at some point I do want maybe David Pumphrey. I'm going to put you on the spot there because you guys are just publishing a paper by Zhang Ko Jun where he was talking about CCS, and I guess for to you or others in the room, do we, you know, one question I have that you can answer momentarily, do we know if in the 12th five-year plan is there going to be, like, CCS targets? We always love targets in the plan, so. Okay, so why don't you go ahead, Steve. Hello, my name is Stephen Andrews. I'm at the UCLA School of Law. I was interested in, I think, one of the, the most fascinating stories of large-scale hydro in China, for example, Three Gorges Dam, is not so much development of large-scale hydro in China, but the fact that the development of that technology is allowed for large-scale Chinese investment and big hydro in Africa, for example. So I'm curious now uh, about some of the comments that China is, is by far the, the world's leader in supercritical, ultra super, supercritical coal fired power plants. What extent do you see China exporting this technology to, for example, India or Brazil or South, South Africa or some of the other countries with large scale coal reserves? Do you see a, a large movement for, for China to export uh, the, this coal powered you know, technology? Uh, and, and how does that impact uh, calculations in terms of uh, development of new coal-fired power plants? And maybe adding on to that, even the the CCS eventually for export. I mean, if, you know, the big dogs Huanong and Shenhua are interested. I think that's a Jonathan question. Okay, well, uh, I, I can start. You can add if you want. Um, 
the uh, scale of construction of coal-fired power plants in, in China is actually uh, declining. Um, you know, the, 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 the peak in, in construction, I think, was 2006. Uh, so you have uh, large uh, power developers that have uh, an incentive to keep their people at work, and uh, there are overseas markets that they are uh, uh, penetrating. You see uh, uh, coal-fired power plants uh, going up in Indonesia. Uh, I think uh, uh, in India there was a, a multi-billion dollar contract signed recently as, as well. It's clear that, uh, that uh, Chinese equipment is going to be found, uh, let's see, in Eastern Europe. Uh, you, you, there was a, recently a deal as well, and you're going to see more uh, of these as well. It's not just uh, China's national oil companies that are going global, but the power companies as well are increasingly uh, looking to expand uh, into into markets in Southeast Asia and and beyond. It's not just to sell equipment; it's to uh, it's to truly uh, go uh, global. Um, and uh, there's there's certainly an incentive, I think, therefore, to work with with China to in, ensure uh, that the equipment that it is selling uh, elsewhere uh, meets uh, meet, meets the needs uh, of of the world and not just of the uh, the companies that are that are selling uh, that, uh, that that equipment. Um, you know, market forces are uh, at work, certainly, but it, it also means that uh, we have a need to work not just with China on uh, regulatory regimes to uh, limit CO2 emissions, but also uh, other developing countries that are going to be buying Chinese equipment. So although uh, the focus does need to be on working with China on technology, on, on regulation, the uh, focus cannot by any means be, be exclusive. Yeah, I, I would just uh, add that uh, you know the this is not this is not theoretical uh, speculation. Uh, we see it in other markets where uh, Chinese technology is is being used. Um, an example would be nuclear power. Uh, the uh, I think it may be the only power plant in the United States that's actually cutting metal for a new uh, power plant. The Southern Company's uh, Vogel plant in Georgia. Um, the big pressure um, uh, chamber is coming from where? It's being built in China. Uh, that's where the expertise is. Uh, that's, that's where the skilled labor force has been assembled. That's where the techniques have been developed to, uh, to build these massive uh, uh, engineering uh, components. Um, and people go where the expertise is. Okay. How about just pass the mic down? We'll just keep moving down the table, and then we'll – and then – and then, and then I'll give you and Mike after a couple of these. We'll let, let this side go for a bit. They seem a bit. Bob G with G Strategies Group. I'm an independent energy consultant. I do most of my work focused on the domestic uh, energy and power markets here in the U.S. I want to say, so, ask a question that's probably going to be controversial. I want to see what type of response I get with that caveat. Not necessarily that I believe in what I'm about to say, but I want to see what what the panel's uh, uh, response would be. It seems to me that where we're at in terms of trying to minimize overall global uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is the fact that I, 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 some of the takeaways I, I picked up with, uh, from uh, 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 Hong Wei was that China has an advantage, for instance, in uh, scaling up uh, pre-commercial or commercial scale uh, demonstration projects to demonstrate out CCS. In the United States, in order for us to construct and demonstrate projects such as these, and I, I speak to something that David touched on, uh, you have to finance these through the U.S. regulatory process. You have to make sure that the amount that you're investing, if you're a publicly traded firm, meets the expectations of shareholders. You have state regulators you have to satisfy in order to pass through costs to ensure that they meet a public interest standard. They don't have that in China. Okay, it's not publicly financed. They don't have pesky state regulators they have to deal with. 
if that being the case, and I say that as a former state regulator, that being the case, why would it make sense for the United States to have domestically cited CCS demonstration projects beyond what we've already done so far? Would it make more sense for, our, for us simply to shift our attention towards China and, as David recommended, encourage direct Western investment in projects in China to demonstrate commercial scale projects? Have our federal government encourage technology transfer agreements, get the, 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 the technology demonstrated as quickly as possible on a commercial scale, and then try to incentivize investment in that sector from, from private finance. Why shouldn't we just be doing that and just stop talking about trying to do any more projects here in the United States? I put that on the table. <laughs> well, perhaps I will start. Um, <laughs> the, uh, in the stimulus uh, bill that was uh, passed in uh, 2009, uh, there's uh, $3.4 billion of, uh, of money provided for CCS uh, projects. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, it has been uh, it it has been allocated, uh, and it remains to be seen how many of those projects actually uh, will get built. But uh, in terms of the sort of political implications of making a financial commitment, uh, we've we've already we've already uh, incurred that uh, political cost, if you will. Um, the additional costs uh, of going through state regulatory pr uh, approval, of course, uh, remain uh, remain as uh, as hurdles. I th I think there there's both a there's there's a substantive and a and a kind of political response that I would give wh as to why it would be a mistake to um, advocate an approach that would that would say let's stop building let's stop trying to build any projects in the United States let's just uh, use China as our uh, as our sandbox um, uh, you know the substantive one is that inevitably we will have more control uh, more experience uh, uh, a greater uh, flow of information that we actually uh, are able to uh, evaluate if if we have leadership roles in some projects and we're not going to have leadership roles in projects in in China we may have participant roles but we're not going to have leadership roles the second is I think again the politics in the United States are, are such that um, even if it were private money going to uh, try to uh, be flow into these projects that would be politically controversial and uh, in, in in China and if it were public money I think it might well be a non-starter um, so I, I think if we want to if we want to get something done we need a package that is a combination of uh, of projects here in the United States uh, that can be financed along with opportunistic uh, uh, targets uh, projects in in China where we can justify that any U.S. investment is actually getting a good return. And on the other side, would China want to be used as the world's sandbox? It's already uh, clearly not the case for uh, IGCC. We know, of course, that Zhang Guabao is on his way out, but uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I saw him wax poetic for about half an hour on uh, why uh, IGCC ought to be uh, uh, implemented elsewhere um, first before it was tried out in, in China, pointed to new uh, coal-fired power plant approvals in the U.S. Asked, are any of those IGCC plants? I don't think so. So uh, there, there is a need for the U.S. to take action in these technology areas in order uh, to uh, facilitate uh, China, India, and other developing countries to take serious action as well. Okay. How about here? Yeah. And then we'll do Lisa and then at the end of the table there. Yeah. Okay. Jeff Price with Blue Wave Resources. Uh, I actually have the opposite view uh, than you, uh, Jonathan, about IGCC in China. Um, China is becoming the world's leader in gasification technology if it's not there already. Uh, the market for gasification in China is expanding while in the West it's uh, uh, declining. Uh, there are already, are already a number of uh, commercial or near commercial Chinese designed uh, gasifiers. Um, China has made a commitment uh, to methanol as a transportation fuel which will probably be produced by polygeneration as uh, you indicated. 
Uh, I'm wondering if uh, the forecast that we saw made for market shares of uh, technologies uh, are understating what uh, IGCC or polygeneration may be doing there. Uh, I'm also wondering whether uh, it's also uh, a technology that uh, is going to be increasingly exported from China. Uh, I know they're already trying to export at least one of their gasifier technologies, the Equist uh, technology, has already made a sale uh, in the U.S. in a uh, uh, not coal gasification, the refining of uh, pet coke in a refinery. Um, you know, that also uh, may be something that uh, uh, is a technology that I think may be understated in terms of the expectations. Uh, that would be, if that's the case, I'd uh, be happy to see that development. Maybe that's why John Guobao is on his way out. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he has called this one in, incorrectly. Uh, but, uh, as in, in many uh, uh, areas of, uh, the, to do with coal, China is, is the place where uh, a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of investment is, is taking place, and increasingly um, R&D and, and innovation uh, as well. Uh, when, you, when you speak with, uh, with officials in China, people in, in, in the companies, uh, uh, to, a, to a certain extent, they all com complain, uh, as we've already heard today, that uh, they lag very far uh, behind uh, the, the U.S. And, and other OECD uh, countries. Um, whether, whether or not that's true, that is, uh, th there's a very strong uh, sense of inferiority in in that in that uh, in that in that area, and that really has to to change. Um, uh, I, I I think in in order to uh, uh, accelerate uh, deployment of, uh, of of advanced coal uh, technologies. As for I'm, I'm not familiar with the the market for for gasifiers, so I, it sounds like you have a great deal more knowledge uh, than I do in that area. I don't know if Hung Wei wants to add something. Yes. Uh, uh, gasification technology is mainly uh, used in ammonia uh, production. And, um, most gas, uh, now China has uh, developed uh, their own uh, uh, many different type uh, gasification technology with with their own IP. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> One thing. I mean, last year we had. Um, with the Clean Air Task Force, we had Ming Song come here to talk, and you know, they're a big uh, matchmaker organization, and they brought together the U.S. company Future Fuels with the Thermal Power Research Institute. And in construction in Pennsylvania, there is a CCS-ready IGCC plant. And uh, what, what we thought, what we found kind of most interesting in the, in the presentation was uh, when we said, so are you going to do this in Pennsylvania, and what next? They said, well, there's no market in the U.S. for it, so we're going to go, we're testing out our partnership here, and then we're going to go to South America and Eastern Europe. But but, I mean, it is interesting that you have, you know, a, a Chinese, you know, research institute, you know, working with the, with the U.S. company, and, you know, and, and I know that Clean Air Task Force is, is trying to, to promote more of these kinds of partnerships. I mean, I can't say that it's not like creating a market here, but it's, it, it's an intriguing model that, that could move forward. Who knows? Just um, one uh, comment. I mean, the, the, the point that those of you who are not uh, technology-oriented should take away on this topic is that there is a big distinction between the industrial gasification market and the power gasification market. Um, uh, the reason that uh, various officials in China and in the United States are more skeptical about power generation gasification is they have a power generation technology that works for coal. Um, pulverized coal boilers work, uh, and they generate uh, coal power uh, cheaply. And the newer ones generate it more efficiently than the old ones. Um, for industrial applications, if you want to use coal as a feedstock, most industrial applications involve gasification. And China has been ahead of the United States uh, in terms of experience on this ma uh, de mass deployment for a, a couple of decades. Uh, and they are uh, growing faster and faster in that area because 
There, the coal is an abundant resource, and uh, the other principal alternative for producing uh, uh, chemicals and fuels is natural gas, and that's expensive, and it's still expensive in China, and they haven't yet found their shale gas uh, resource. Uh, they may find one, but uh, at this point, it's still expensive, and most of it's in western China. So coal is the thing to use to turn into these high-value-added products, and gasification is the technique to use to do it. Thank you. I'm getting smarter every second pass through. Lisa, ask a question to continue to make me smarter. And then we'll keep moving on that side. Robert, please pass the Thanks, Lisa Friedman from Climate Wire. Thanks for doing this today. It's really helpful. Um, and my question might dovetail with, with Jennifer's about the five year plan, but I was hoping that, that you could kind of explain to us the Chinese government's thinking and how it has evolved on. CCS. I understand that over a relatively short period of time, the government has has um, has changed its thinking significantly on CCS. But I'm wondering, you know, at the at the moment, also, is is most of the interest and money um, coming from the pri from private industry, or or is there also government support for for CCS development? What do you expect to see any as as specific as as possible, if you, if anyone knows what you know, out of out of the visit uh, next week on CCS as well. Thanks. Okay. None of us is a spokesman for the for the Chinese government here, <laughs> so I can only speak as as outside uh, observers. Um, um, I, I I might uh, uh, point out that uh, the Chinese government is not a monolith. And uh, different parts uh, of it have expressed different attitudes towards CCS at, at different times. Uh, five years ago, it might have been difficult to get any but a few enthusiasts in the Ministry of Science and Technology or the Chinese Academy of Sciences to uh, to even take a meeting uh, with you on on CCS, and that's changed uh, quite quite a bit now. Um, uh, we've heard that uh, uh, Shenhua and uh, Huanang are taking CCS uh, quite quite seriously, and that raises a regulatory issue uh, for uh, the government, uh, essentially forcing uh, NDRC um, and the National Energy Administration to take note and to uh, take steps towards uh, understanding uh, what the technology is, where it might go, where it might fit in uh, what uh, to, to understand what these companies might do that would make China's climate change negotiating position even more difficult than it already is. Um, and so uh, that means that uh, perhaps uh, reluctantly you, you have uh, uh, different parts of government that would prefer to ignore it, uh, taking uh, note of it. But um, at, at least in, in, in our experience, it's still an issue that rests mainly with the Ministry of Science and Technology, since it is a burgeoning R&D field, uh, and uh, there's, there's a lot of international activity. They're quite interested uh, in it and participating um, not just uh, in, uh, in international for the Carbon Sequestration Leadership for it, Forum is, um, is is an area where we've seen, long seen uh, in Chinese uh, participation. At, uh, they're participating in uh, the um, uh, uh, Global CCS uh, in Institute. Uh, you have international projects like uh, NZEC, the the NZEC project with EU and the UK. Uh, moving, moving forward, the bilateral cooperation on CCS uh, with, um, with with the U.S. is 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 certainly growing, and you're you're seeing a real uh, it's turning into uh, a, a, a serious uh, a serious issue both domestically and internationally for China. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, first, uh, I think that. You know, at least uh, in the decade that uh, has just ended, uh, there was a fairly prevalent attitude uh, among a number of Chinese officials that, that I observed, which is that they heard the conversation about IGCC as kind of a conversation coming from Western uh, 
uh, d diplomats uh, basically where the Western diplomats were saying to China, you're building all this coal. Uh, you have a responsibility, China, to do it differently. So you should be exploring these things like IGCC. And I think, you know, the official's response was a pushback and saying, you know, uh, what do you mean? Uh, you know, we're not we're not going to be shoved into doing something that because you think we have a responsibility to do it. And I think that even that even made uh, some some uh, created some reluctance to even do demonstration projects out of a fear that well gee if we do this demonstration project and it works uh, we're going to be under increasing pressure to to make it a mandate for every new coal plant and we're not ready to uh, put ourselves uh, on that uh, that pathway so the attitude was one of uh, you know are we going to position ourselves to potentially be disadvantaged in this in international diplomatic uh, 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 hand arm wrestling over uh, the technology to be applied to coal plants? Uh, I think uh, that is changing. Um, the fact that the Europeans have uh, uh, moved forward with their own CCS uh, deployment initiatives still to be funded in some respect, uh, that the United States has taken some steps. Again, we've talked about the fact that that still could wind up a fizzle. But also just because I think uh, increasingly the Chinese officials have decided to look at this technology not not through the lens of how does this play in the diplomatic uh, uh, context, but what's the interest uh, for China itself. And when they look at it through that lens, it starts to make a little more sense. Uh, and the final thing that I think has changed is that uh, some of these big private sector companies uh, like Shenhua and Huaneng uh, are becoming interested in actually getting uh, commercial scale demonstrations up and running. So you've got a push from the private sector uh, saying to the government officials saying, you know, let's cooperate to make this happen. And I think that changes the attitude as well. Um. I'd like to talk something about the next uh, five-year plan. Uh, uh, now, China, uh, the central government uh, is carrying out the national pilot program of uh, low-carbon province and low-carbon city. Uh, this uh, program will be implemented in five uh, provinces and eight cities. Um, actually, last summer, I have been in China for, for two months to do some investigation about uh, this uh, uh, issue. I found uh, almost every uh, city, every, every province is developing um, their own low carbon planning. For, uh, but I found that this planning is just like uh, put, putting an uh, old wine into a new bottle. <laughs> I, actually, uh, uh, the, the, the national pilot program actually offers a uh, Great opportunity for for U.S.-China collaboration. Maybe the Chinese uh, provincial leader, local official, needs expert developers in, in U.S. states or subnational uh, level. I think um, this um, I think this was an important issue in, in the next five-year plan. So the capacity. So China has the uh, strategy to develop low carbon, but the capacity building maybe is uh, capacity maybe a main barrier to its development. Okay. And Hungwei, can I ask you also that that I mean, since you you know you're in the research community, over the over the past few years, I mean, has has the Ministry of Science and Technology been throwing more money at uh, Chinese researchers who are looking into CCS and IGCC? Mm -hmm. So I mean, is it growing a lot? Uh, yes. Now, uh, um, just one example. Uh, in 2000, uh, in 2008, I have attended the uh, inter uh, GHGT9 conference, mainly focused on CSF. Uh, 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 at attended the conference in uh, DC here. Uh, there are about 1,400 uh, people attend this conference, but only five participants from Chinese uh, China mainland. Mm -hmm. At this time, this year in Netherlands. Uh, there are more than there are about thirty participants from mainland China. They all focus on CCS. This this is an example of focus. The more and more researchers are focused on CCS research. Yeah. 
Because I know, and David, can I put you on the spot there? But that about the because you, you that, that give, we'll give you the question that that in the report that you guys are throwing up on the website soon from John Ko Jun. Did he t- he was t- from e, he's from ERI? Did he he talked about CCS as moving forward, right? Yeah, thanks. I, I thought I'd passed off the uh, oh, okay. the, the mic to uh, avoid being put on the spot. Uh, oh. David Pumphrey from the Center for Strategic International Studies. We are posting a report that we had commissioned uh, Jean Cajun with the Energy Research Institute to look at a uh, lower carbon um, um, possibilities for China, so looking out through 2050 with the modeling work that he does. Um, and he looks at the different technology implementation paths and um, what that means from a a macroeconomic point of view. And CCS clearly becomes, as this discussion has said, critical to achieving the lower carbon pathways. And within a macro sense, and he participated in a conference we had, his macro assessment was China can afford it. We can afford CCS. But I do think, and this gets to a question I was going to throw out there, which I don't know if we can go very far on. At a micro level, though, we're still looking at a pretty big gap in terms of efficiency, cost, and now water usage. And I guess the question would be, um, I know David is saying that he has faith that it will be uh, closed, but are we on a pathway to get that closed? Do we have, does the the, uh, thermodynamics work to actually be able to close that gap? Because it, in some ways, doesn't make sense to me that China, ha- who has been stressing so much moving the most efficient coal burning technologies into the marketplace, will want to move, and the coal in the power sector, I think the industrial sector is different, will want to move with in a big way to a co- technology that goes the other direction in terms of the efficiency of using coal. That I think is a, a major problem, and I think the water issues uh, that Hung Wei had mentioned are also another major issue. So I don't know if there's any thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, uh, two quick comments. Uh, as Hung Wei's slide pointed out, and, and uh, our DOE has similar numbers, uh, the, uh, a, a gasification plant, even with carbon capture, has uh, lower water use per kilowatt hour than a conventional coal plant without capture. So the water use aspect actually runs in the in the right direction with respect to gasification. Yes, you use somewhat more water if you are uh, then uh, uh, capturing the carbon associated with it because you have to cool down that additional energy uh, activity. Uh, with respect to efficiency, uh, the uh, see, uh, carbon capture, the way it is engineered today, is all, always shows up with an energy penalty, and that's because it's basically engineered uh, as as a bolt-on technology. Even even if it's a gasification-based system, it's still basically a bolt-on technology. You have the you have the base the base machinery, and then you add something that requires additional work to do to do something that is that uses more energy than just uh, letting the stuff go out the stack. Um, the, one of the things that has not yet been fully explored is looking at all of the heat and energy and steam flows associated with these these power plants and re-engineering them so that they are optimized for efficiency when they are using carbon capture. Right now, the base design is optimized for energy efficiency when you're not using carbon capture. So you're you're essentially pulling available sources of heat and steam and power from this optimized system and diverting it to something other than making power. Uh, And that inevitably shows up as an energy penalty. Uh, And the obvious thing that engineers should explore, and it's always dangerous for a lawyer to be suggesting, uh, (laughs) you know, the the ways to deal with the laws of thermodynamics, uh, is is they they need to take a, a, a ground up assessment of the entire energy management uh, system in these power plants to see how to optimize it for a configuration that is built from the ground up to capture carbon. And, and once they once they start exploring that in a serious way, I think we're going to find some aha moments that are going to produce some breakthroughs. But uh, this is optimism rather than faith. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned cost, and we're also uh, uh, dealing with a world now that does not have a, a serious carbon price. Once you have a carbon price in mm-hmm. place, the uh, calculus changes. 
considerably. So the frame of reference, uh, both technically and, uh, and in terms of policy, in terms of regulation, needs to change to make CCS uh, work. Yeah. Do we, and, and you know, and also, I mean, then the lingering question too about the water. Where does it where does it come from? I mean, because that that's what's. I mean, China, most of China's coal in the north, and the unexplained. You know, I loved your little map there. I'm totally going to steal it from my own PowerPoint. You know, with where the coal is, how it's being. You know, how they're moving further west, where there's no water, and then there's the proposal, the Bohai pipeline. You guys all heard about that? All right. Some of you have nodding your head. That that proposal to build a pipeline taking water from Bohai using nuclear power to desalinate it and pump that stuff out to Xinjiang where they're sitting on top of something like 30% of untapped coal reserves. I mean, you know, it, it sounds ludicrous, but at the same time, they need coal. And so, you know, so it, I'm just, I toss that out there just to kind of, because we don't want to forget water. Yeah, just one other quick point on water, which is the, the, water, the water issue is an economic issue more than it is a technical issue. There are air cooling, dry cooling uh, technologies available, and they are used when water is priced at a level that makes those other technologies economically rational. So uh, it, to some extent, there's an equilibrium that sets in with respect to demands on water. And as the, uh, as the demands on water go up and the prices go up, then some of these other technologies to uh, cool become uh, economically rational. Good. All right. Now the long neglected person, at the, the people at the end of the table, you two get it now. Okay, uh, Xiao Chun from uh, Virginia Tech, and uh, I have two comments on this. The first one is uh, uh, for uh, CCSD in China, uh, we we cannot expect that we have a unanimous uh, government uh, position here. For example, like Jiang Kejun, and he is uh, a big promoter for this, but uh, he definitely has. Uh, 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 like rivals uh, who think differently. So that's why within the government we don't have a, a official position on that. But uh, when you just look back at uh, chi uh, China's uh, reform and f f the, the whole process is crossing the river, touching the stone, and the uh, pilot project is always there. So CCS now is only a uh, we, we are now talking more about the marketization or just make it like uh, really in market. But uh, actually now it's still only, only in the pilot project, which still very far from just to be put that into the market. There are some projects out there. And uh, for in government, because every year I, I went back to China for some time to talk with different people. And... Uh, the debate was still there, and uh, there's no really some, something which is uh, final, say that we agree that uh, this uh, should be done in this way, but uh, only the pilot project. That's why when we just uh, go back to see that whether this just uh, change China's uh, climate change uh, negotiation position, this will not be a, a baseline or benchmark which will just set for the, uh, for the energy production. So, yeah. Uh, with this, and uh, we can also see uh, the policymakers uh, who are just uh, trying to uh, uh, make their way to this uh, direction. And uh, e only uh, by the end of last year, or the, even this uh, early this year, there's a new law published, and the promote. There were three different elements uh, uh, which were promoted for uh, to, to for China to achieve this. Uh, uh, clean development, and uh, they listed uh, several technologies. CCSD was there, but uh, still, it's a pilot, not uh, not uh, really the, the the big market out there. Okay, thank you. And so maybe we won't see it as a as a goal in the twelfth five year plan. But hey, March is soon around the corner. We will see soon. Okay, yes, sir. Thank you very much. I'm David Rosenberg from Middlebury College and thank Australia you. National University in Canberra. That inspires <laughs> this question. Uh, I have a question about China's coal imports. Uh, some time ago this morning, Jonathan Sinton put up there very briefly uh, one graph of China's coal imports. And I only got a quick glance at it, but it showed what I thought was a sharp and steady increase. And so I'd like to ask you about that. Uh, what are the implications of that? Where is it coming from? How is it getting to 
China exactly, over what shipping lanes in particular, and do you see any constraints or bottlenecks in this assumption that it will flow smoothly uh, for uh, the, well, that's not it. There you go. There you go. Okay. Can you tell us more about that uh, graph and what you think the implications are as, as uh, available supply meeting the growing demand? Uh, Thanks uh, for the question. Good, good, good and question. And nice seeing you down here from Middlebury or New Zealand, whichever one it was. <laughs> uh, uh, interested in your affiliations. Yeah, I'm I know. Not, I'm, not, I'm not sure which of us has the greater carbon boot print. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, the uh, appearance on uh, of, of, of China as as a big importer has been a cause for uh, uh, joy in some quarters, as I'm sure you're uh, as I'm sure you're uh, aware, and a cause uh, for uh, bottlenecks at Australian uh, coal ports as as well, uh, which are. Um, uh, being being worked out, as I understand, or it, the, it's really short to, to medium term uh, issues in terms of, of the resource that uh, worldwide that China's uh, drawing on. Uh, I don't think there's there's really uh, a, a a question about uh, the the, the uh, plentifulness of, of coal. There's plenty of coal. Um, in, in Australia, in Indonesia, even in Vietnam, there's, there's a bit of coal from Vietnam that's flowing into China. Uh, there's talk of uh, coal from the Powder River Basin going to, uh, to, to, to China as well. Uh, you know, uh, if the economics uh, are, are right, it will uh, flow to, to, to China and uh, the, the investments uh, can be made uh, to 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 get it there, so uh, you know in the in the medium to to long term, there's really no constraint. The real worries are uh, about uh, fluctuations in uh, China's role on on coal markets. Is it going to is its demand suddenly going to uh, dry up and cause the coal prices to 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 collapse? Is it uh, you know, the, the the problem is that. Uh, a small fluctuation on Chinese markets, uh, you know, may look small in China, but if you look through the other end of the telescope, it looks it looks awfully big. Um, and so, uh, a, a minor move that wouldn't concern um, uh, coal producers in in China may have producers in in other countries. Uh, uh, scrambling uh, as well. Uh, there's a, there's a process of education that needs to uh, <laughs> needs that needs to happen, whereby uh, the uh, policymakers in China understand um, uh, how moves in China, how trends in China affect international uh, coal markets without feeling threatened, without without feeling blamed. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of a problem with, uh, with, with that at, at, at the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's really a, a problem of, of, of perception of, of politics. It's not a, a, a long-term problem of resources or, or economics. Can, can I ask you a question? Because yeah. I've heard that, that the, and I don't know if it's true, that's why I have a coal expert next to me here, that the coal that they're importing, that there's something maybe qualitatively better that this coal, is it going to, to cert, because I've heard stories that maybe certain ultra supercritical coal-fired power plants can't always use the coal that's mined in China, or the coal, is, it, is there, I mean, where is this coal going? Is there a specific reason that, that they want the Australian coal, or? Well, a, a, a power plant is, you know, built for fuel of a certain specification, and if you want your, your plant to be performing uh, as efficiently, as, as cleanly, as it's as it's designed for, you need a stable fuel supply, and um, uh, coal uh, fuel supplies in, in China are notoriously variable. And uh, you know, a coastal power plant uh, uh, operator is uh, you know going to be happy to pay a, a premium to have a, a fuel supply, even if it comes from abroad, that's going to allow them to uh, to to operate better. Okay, so it's more like just operating, not the quality of the coal. 
Itself. Yeah, a uh, couple a couple of comments on this. That I, first, I agree with everything that Jonathan said. Uh, the uh, the it, you know imports are not likely to p play a large role in the Chinese coal market, but because of the very size of the Chinese coal demand, imports you know China's import behavior could have an influence on global. Uh, coal prices, um, but the the the, uh, the the activity of importing coal, especially for coastal uh, plants, is not unusual. Um, we have a, a number of plants in our Gulf State region in the U.S. that uh, they get their coal from Colombia and Venezuela. We have some other coal uh, uh, other plants that get their coal from Indonesia. Uh, uh, so it's not unusual for these kind of niche markets uh, uh, to develop. The other thing to note is that these imports include both steam coal, which is for power production, and metallurgical coal, uh, which is uh, for iron and steel uh, production and is, uh, is of the very high quality that you're talking about, very high price. Uh, and uh, that is traded more in international markets than than is steam coal typically. But uh, there is a big international market in steam coal. Uh, Australian coal production, uh, uh, more than you know, more than half of it, it goes to exports. I think it's something like seventy five percent of the production is for export to mostly to Asian markets, some European markets. So. There is a significant amount of uh, international uh, uh, coal trade, uh, but I, I think one shouldn't make too much of the, the fact that the Chinese imports grew uh, in percentage terms because they grew off of a tiny base, and that percentage uh, number is misleading if you look at it without seeing the curve that is up on the screen uh, here, uh, there's a very good paper that I'm forgetting the authors that was done in the last year that essentially explains this as opportunistic coal purchasing by private sector players, and it's nothing having to do with any kind of strategic uh, positioning of uh, of governmental policy in in China. Okay, um, one one quick, I think one last quick question here. Kushin will get it. He's Kushin's coming to you. Behind you, and then we'll close out. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question about uh, which part or how much of the, uh, the, the, the demand driving the capacity is uh, for China's own domestic demand and how much of it is for the global manufacturing. And I say that because I believe that there are a number of uh, structural constraints on how much uh, China's own domestic demand uh, can grow. Thank you. Yeah. And who are you? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. This, I'm Louisa Zhang. I work for the National Endowment for Democracy. Thank you. <laughs> Jonathan probably has the sites memorized on this, but a significant <laughs> fraction, you know, there have been several papers done now that a significant fraction of China's CO2 emissions and, and, and therefore its coal consumption is associated with the production of goods for sale to Western countries like the United States. So uh, the, even, even if there is some, um, uh, some limitation on the growth rate of domestic consumption in China, uh, there are these other markets around the world that China is uh, consuming coal uh, to serve. Uh, although, given you know, given uh, things uh, like automobile manufacturing and the growth in automobile manufacturing in China and the attendant need to uh, have power to produce the underlying materials, I doubt that there's much of a constraint on domestic consumption in, in, in meaningful terms in the next few decades. Yeah, I mean, as the urbanization, I mean, we've got another 350 million that are going to be urbanized over the next 15, 20 years. So, yeah, but, I, yeah. I, I, I actually have forgotten the, <laughs> the numbers in <laughs> he says it so recent, often. <laughs> recent uh, uh, an analysis. But uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, can, there is a great deal of energy-intensive development left to, to do in, in China. So uh, I think you're going to see uh, most of the... Uh, energy demand growth in China resulting from uh, domestic activity. Um, I uh, alluded earlier to the internationalization of uh, Chinese uh, corporate ac activity. There's already a move towards offshoring of some of their manufacturing operations, the same way that uh, 
uh, uh, U.S. companies have offshored some of their manufacturing in, into China. So it's not just it's not just one way. You're going to see China Chinese companies behaving uh, like other companies have as well. It's a really complex kind of kind of question. So. Um, it's 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 hard to analyze, but uh, I don't think that uh, we're going to be able to uh, attribute most of, or majority of, or even a very large portion of China's future energy demand growth to uh, demand from international markets. Okay, he's promised me he's got a super short question. Hello. Yeah. All right. Uh, two really short questions. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. You uh, lied to me. <laughs> I lied. Yeah. Uh, this is Monty Martin, by the way, and no particular affiliation. But uh, I have a question about the Shenhua coal to fuel plant that's currently operating in Inner Mongolia. And uh, David, I, I read your uh, remarks about that in the NDRC paper. And according to those numbers, it looks like over a year, 2.2 million tons of coal are used to produce 7 million ba barrels of oil or uh, fuel that can be used for transportation. That seems like a real loser of a project. Um, and, and I guess my question is, uh, this also goes for Hongwei. Uh, in, your, in your paper, you had said that forces were, were uh, at play in China to stop these types of plants from uh, being produced. And I'd like to know which forces those are. Uh, is it like international NGOs who are um, who are stopping these, these kinds of plants, or is it more domestic? Uh, and my last, my, my second question has to do with rare earth elements. And um, Let's just stick with the first question, because okay. we're going to have a rare earth meeting down the road here. So, all right, so the, the Shenhua coal plant, well, I've, heard, uh, I've heard is the largest point source of CO2. Possibly. Yeah, it's, it is huge. Uh, and NRDC is, uh, to put it mildly, not a fan of uh, coal to liquids uh, uh, to, uh, uh, projects. Uh, we think uh, that it's uh, I impossible to turn coal into transportation fuel and uh, and protect the climate if you do it at any scale. So we are opposing that technology uh, wherever we have the capacity to oppose it. In the case of the Shenhua project, this is a project that is operating, and if it and our, our attitude toward that project is given that it is operating, if it can be a platform for doing uh, some carbon capture demonstration, that's, that's a good thing. It's, it doesn't make the project a good thing, but it does uh, create a platform and an opportunity. So that's our, 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 our view on um, why that should, could be a host for a CCS project, not because we'd like to see a proliferation of this technology. We would not, and we are opposing that. Uh, and we have greater capacity to oppose those projects in the United States than we do in China. Yeah. Did, did you want to... Okay. One one thing I will say that the NDRC has actually come out and said that they're not they're they're halting pilot projects on coal to liquids. You know they had five planned and now there's just the Shenhua and one other. So because of the water, go team. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys. I mean this is. I mean, it really is fascinating stuff. And uh, keep in mind that, you know, we're going to dip down again. We'll probably get the, the West Virginia University folks in with their Cirque Chinese partners down the road here. Um, and also, Chun Jae Kwai La coming down the pike. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. I just, it, I, I've been so, you know, scared to do a meeting on CCS because I thought, really? oh. Well, it's just because it was so, like, oh, it's so technical. But you guys did it. You made it accessible.